Today's episode is with Dr. Peter Kozlowski. He's a functional medicine MD, and he uses a broad array of tools to find the source of body, the body's dysfunction. Um, he specializes in gut health. And so today we're talking all about the gut and the microbiome. We're talking about the impact of emotions and trauma and stress on the microbiome and how that actually manifest different probiotic levels that we'll have in our gut. It's a super fascinating episode. I totally put him on the hot seat and asked him his opinion on carnivore and keto and all sorts of things, which he was so awesome to just answer very candidly his, his thoughts and his experiences. Um, he's talking about how to optimize your gut health and how to understand like some interesting things like, um, that like SIBO, you don't always have symptomology. You don't, in terms of having bloating and all these things, it could be eczema or other things. So he just, really, um, it brings a lot to the table in terms of gut health. And his book on this is called unfunk your gut, a functional medicine guide. Um, what I really appreciate, appreciate about Dr. Kozlowski is that he is in the trenches every day. You know, it's, it's so nice to have these doctors and coaches and, you know, people who are like in the trenches with people every day working on these things and learning things, you know, and in, in addition to all their education, it's so valuable. So I think you guys are going to love this episode. Here is Dr. Peter Kozlowski. Before we jump into the show, I am extremely honored to share with you the sponsor of this podcast, and that is Rep Provisions. And I want to tell you a little bit about who they are, what they're about. They are a regenerative agriculture company. They are a ranch. I have been to the ranch myself. Incredible. And if you aren't familiar with regenerative agriculture, it is my extreme honor to introduce you. So here's a few statistics of why regenerative agriculture is important before I get into what it is. First of all, the United States is losing topsoil 10 times faster than it's replenishing it right now. And this comes from our modern conventional agriculture practices that we've really just developed in the last several decades. The way we are raising cattle and the way we are growing these monocrops of plants is depleting our topsoil at astronomical rates. And I love the way Eric Perner, the founder uh, and owner of Rep Provisions, the rancher there at the ranch, I love how he puts this. He says that our planet is just a giant rock spinning in space with a tiny layer of topsoil and subsoil that supports all life on the planet. Every economy, every nation is sustained by this layer of topsoil. It's really important, right? We don't have any soil or quality soil health goes down and then eventually life goes away. Right. So it's, it's so important. Um, right now we're losing about 75 billion tons of topsoil every year, because as it erodes from these conventional farming practices, it goes into the waterways and then goes into the ocean and we lose it. So it's not sustainable, obviously, and we have to regenerate the topsoil. And this is where regenerative agriculture comes in. And the way they raise their animals is supportive of regeneration of the topsoil. So you can listen to my podcast episode with Eric Perner if you want to learn more about exactly how they do it. It's so important. Now, from a health perspective, this is so cool. Um, Eric just shared with me that they had their meat lab tested at Michigan State University. And if you're not familiar with omega-6 to omega-3 ratios, let me share this with you real quick. So omega-6s are pro-inflammatory. They're in all foods. Omega-3s are anti-inflammatory. So this is all foods have a certain ratio of omega-6 to omega-3. Now the ideal is one-to-one, -one, right? So we balance out that pro-inflammatory aspect of food, which is important. It triggers a lot of things in our body, but we balance it with the anti-inflammatory effect. On average, Americans are 10 to one. Their omega-6 to omega-3 ratio is 10 to one because honestly, we eat so much canola oil and so many processed foods and all the way up to 30 to one and higher. It's super inflammatory, causes heart disease, cancer, all disease. Um, grain fed meat is on average five to one ratio or worse. And what came back from Michigan state university is that rep provisions meat has a one to one omega six to omega three ratio, which is freaking huge. Um, so, so cool. I'm so glad they found that out. And by the way, just FYI, grain fed chicken has a 15 to one ratio and seed oils are the worst like canola. Um, so we mean all these industrial seed oils, 70 to one or worse. And they estimate that 25% of the calories in the American diet come from canola oil. No wonder there's so much disease. No wonder everyone's so unhealthy. So just wanted to share that with you guys. This is not only an amazing way to support the planet, but also your own health. 
Um, and they're giving you guys an awesome discount. It's one of the highest discounts they offer 15% off anything with code coach Tara. So I'll link that in the show notes, or you can go to repprovisions.com anytime and just use the coupon code coach Tara and get 15% off. Okay. So the gut microbiome, this has become a very hot topic. I feel like in the last maybe, you know, 10, but really the last five, four, three years, gut microbiome, a lot of people are interested in it. The awareness is starting to increase. So I'm excited to talk about your book and everything that you're doing in your work daily on helping with gut health. Um, and I know Dr. Zach Bush, who I'm sure you're familiar with, you know, even he admits that we barely know anything about the gut still, but there are a lot of things we do know, and that is really exciting. And so as a baseline, you know, what should the general public know about the gut microbiome? I would say before we get into the gut microbiome, I think that the most important thing that people miss the most about their gut is that the inside of your gut tube is considered outside of your body. So your gut is a tube that starts with the mouth and ends with the anus. There's openings on both ends. Yeah. Yeah. And so that is just a long highway running through your body and the gut, you know, the, the roles of the gut that people are familiar with are digestion and absorption. We eat our macronutrients, we break them down, and then we absorb the micronutrients into our blood. On the other side of this gut tube is the bloodstream. And the bloodstream is inside your body. So to me, the most important role of the gut is to decide what comes in and what stays out. And it works like the skin, but the difference is, is your skin has three layers and they all have a ton of cells in them. Your gut lining is a single layer of cells. It's super thin. So it is very easy for things to cross from the outside world into our inside world. And with everything that we've done to our food supply, our environment, the medications, all of that, it we're getting more and more toxins inside the body. And the other thing that's waiting there in the blood is the immune system. And so the immune system's job is kind of picking out like, okay, this gluten protein looks okay. These nutrients look good. Let's let them in. But with all the changes we've made to our food in a lot of people that, or the toxins that are coming in, the immune system is right, right away, attaching, fighting off these things that in, in, assumes are toxins. And then you've got inflammation in the blood. And what happens with your blood? It goes everywhere from your head to your toes. Yeah. So that is how disease like Hippocrates said it a few thousand years ago, all disease begins in the gut. In my opinion, it's mostly because that's the entryway into our body. And since he said that everything we've done is destroy our guts. And that, so that's an important concept that I think is it in reality is really simple, but it's not like the way we were taught to think about it, even right. going through medical school and residency, like that's just not the way we think about it. Um, but it, that I think a lot of times helps people just, you know, decide what am I going to eat? Right. Yeah. And, and because that's, what's going to be getting into my body. And is that going to be supporting my body or is that going to be destroying my body? Exactly. I, I think there's a huge disconnect between how does this taste in my mouth? And then what actually happens once it goes in there, you know, we just think, (laughs) sorry for being crude, but we just think it's like, it does nothing really. It just goes in your stomach and comes out as poop and that's it. And it's just that there's nothing, you know, we forget that our bodies are these super advanced biotech suits that have all these crazy needs to fuel them, you know? And I, I love that. Um, that, that explanation of this like passageway, it's like a, like a highway that's like sending all everything that we're going to be able to be using. And also, yeah, man, the, 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 the talk about the immune system, right. And this is something I see so much with clients who have high inflammation or hypothyroidism or, you know, PCOS or a million other things. It's like when you're already inflamed, I mean, your immune system is like a sitting duck, you know? And so I want to talk, uh, my first question for you is like, what are the biggest hitters that you see in your work that are causing the problems of the things that people are putting into their bodies? So the biggest causes, it's just everything in our environment. Um, So to to answer your question about the microbiome, because that's kind of where we start damaging our gut. 
the microbiome, all of us have three to five pounds of bacteria growing inside our large intestine. That's where it should be growing. Mm -hmm. The generic term is probiotics. The way that I really like to think about your microbiome is that it is like your own garden growing inside of you. Nice. And in that analogy, the probiotics are the plants. Fiber is the fertilizer that feeds the garden. But what happens in a garden when you don't take care of it is weeds grow. Yeah. And that is called dysbiosis. That could be called SIBO. That could be due to bacteria, parasites, yeasts. That is, is a, what sends inflammation into our body when, you're, when your microbiome is imbalanced. That's how that can lead to disease. Mm -hmm. so the triggers for this going wrong start at birth. And the way that we get a microbiome is during a vaginal delivery, the infant picks up good bacteria from the vaginal canal probiotics right now, one out of every three people are born by C-section. When you're C-section, you go straight out of the belly into the delivery nurse's gloves. They've done stool tests, which is how we test your microbiome on babies born by C-section. And they find the same bacteria that was in the delivery nurses on the delivery nurses gloves growing in the baby's gut. Wow. They also test women for group B strep um, right before delivery. And if you're GBS positive, they will give you antibiotics. You get <laughs> antibiotics right at delivery. You are killing your vaginal flora. Wow. So that. So that's the beginning, right? That yeah. so we're screwing up our guts from day one. Then a microbiome, we get it from breast milk. Breast milk, to me, the most important thing about it is that it's full of pre and probiotics. Well, a ton of people have been formula fed for various reasons without supplementing probiotics. Right. And then, then it's our diet and lifestyle that um, can damage our gut. And probably the worst thing for your microbiome are antibiotics. What are antibiotics? They were ta they're tablets or capsules that were designed to kill bacteria. Where do we put them? In a tube that has five pounds of bacteria in it. So taking one course of antibiotics ever um, can wipe out up to half of your microbiome. Question for you. Is there ever a scenario in which you would put someone on an antibiotic in like a really acute situation? hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. So if you're in that situation, you've gone to a gut health specialist and they're like, you have a lot of stuff going on, like a lot of bacterial overgrowth and you are put on an antibiotic. What's your recommendation for your path? You know, once after you've taken the antibiotics or during, you know, what, what, what would you tell people? Cause I know there's a lot of people that are like, crap, man, I know antibiotics are bad for me. I don't really want to take them. I need to, what do I do now to, you know, <laughs> offset the damage? Right. So, I mean, I, I would, I tr would not treat someone's imbalances in their microbiome using antibiotics. I would use uh, natural antibiotics, herbs, things mm. like oregano oil, berberine, uva ursi, caprylic acid, silver, mm. things like that. Mm. So that's what, that's going to be 99.9% .9 of the time, my first route of treatment. But I mean, I was trained as a regular family practice doctor. I know there's benefits of antibiotics if you're very acutely ill if you've got a bacteria that's overgrowing your lungs or your blood or your skin right. you need help to eliminate it so the best thing that you can do is i just actually i had someone this morning that i worked with who just had back surgery and they gave him antibiotics post-op and so what we did is we were starting a broad spectrum probiotic um so that means lots of different species and the other thing is that we're using is Saccharomyces boulardii, which is a yeast-based probiotic. Hmm. So one of the big things that happens when you take antibiotics is candida overgrows. Right. And, and Sac boulardii is a way to prevent candida. So hmm. we'll, he'll be on that regimen for 30 days. It's really nice because he had stool testing done before the surgery. So we know what his microbiome looked like. So we know what we're working with. Right. Um, majority of people have never had a stool analysis because regular medicine just doesn't do it. Um, and then, cause a lot of times we'll, you know, some of my patients are 10 years old, 40 years old, 80 years old. I see everybody. All right. 
and we get this dysbiosis back, right? They've got bacteria, they've got parasites. And a lot of times the first question is, is, well, when, how long has this been here? I have no clue, right? right? It could have been there for two weeks. It could have been there for 70 years. And so hopefully one day part of like regular medicine is to assess people's microbiomes. Um, and I did read like a long time ago, probably 10 years ago, almost that some of the major pharmaceutical companies were working on drugs for the microbiome. So I think as soon as they come up with some drugs, then regular <laughs> medicine will accept stool testing and the mind. It'll be a disaster, right. but at least it'll become more extreme. well-known. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe a bridge, hopefully a bridge to something a little more optimal than that. And, you know, I, you mentioned parasites. That's a question I have too, because I've actually been quite amazed how many people actually do have parasites. Um, and, and I, and my question is, you know, what are some symptoms may, that people might be interested in getting tested to see if they might have parasites? Anything that falls under IBS symptoms, bloating, gas, smelly gas, um, indigestion, heartburn, um, changes in your stools. So any, any kind of basically gut symptom. I mean, yeah. when, when I do stool analysis, uh, we're always including full parasitology. Um, and yeah, so I, I mean, I like to test everybody. Like I, the first time I did a stool analysis, I had parasites. Wow. Um, I traveled a lot. So I just assumed that I picked it up somewhere um, abroad. Yeah. Um, so is this I something think, you see commonly? They're not that common. Okay. Um, I, I probably, I mean, I do stool testing uh, pretty much every day and like five cases a year. Okay. Um, okay. So it's, it's pretty rare. I hadn't seen any in 2021. And then in the matter of a week, I got three, um, mm. and from people from different parts. And, and so, but that's just how medicine goes is usually everything comes in waves. So what? not that common. Um, but we definitely catch them. What are some of the most common gut issues that you see? Is it just the, the dysbiosis, the lack of, you know, the good guys fighting off the bad guys and the bad guys start to take over? Is that, or, you know, what about ulcers, for example? Um, you know, how often do you see that? What, what are your thoughts around ulcers? That's something I hear, you know, people say, oh, I found out I had an ulcer. You know, what insights do you have for somebody who is told they have a, a bleeding ulcer in their gut? If they've stomach. got a bleeding ulcer. They probably need that's they need traditional medicine. They need to have it cauterized. They need to have the bleeding stopped. Mm -hmm. Once the bleeding stopped, then they could come to me and we can do things to heal, to calm down the gut lining, which could be things like glutamine. It could be um, magnesium can be healing. Aloe can be healing to the gut. So that, you know, in, in my world, we talk a lot of crap about traditional medicine. It's definitely you know, if you have a bleeding ulcer, you don't want to come to me. You, you, <laughs> you need to go to a doctor who can scope you and close that bleeding up. Yeah. I appreciate that. It's like, they, they definitely have their place, you know, right. but for long-term chronic stuff, it's maybe not the best, but for acute, it's really helpful. What are some other common gut issues that you see? Food sensitivities that can present as gut issues. No, that Sorry. That's a question I have too, um, on food sensitivities. Do you see food sensitivities as the cause for gut issues, or do you see them as a result of gut issues? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I don't know. They're both, right? <laughs> yeah. I, I, there's so many factors that can cause a leaky gut, right? So we were talking about the gut as the gateway into the body. That's that term leaky gut when your barrier is lost, but is it you know, the gut is leaky and then these food antigens get into the blood and the immune system attacks, or is it these food antigens that are just attacking the gut lining that makes it leaky and lets them in? It's most likely both. Um, in my, in my experience in general, like in traditional medicine, they're very obsessed with like one cause equals this, right? right. Like this, it definitely <laughs> equals that. In, in my practice, it's, ne it's never like that. Like it, right. it's always a combination of things. 
Okay. I, I'm also curious, uh, can we talk about emotions and their relation to gut health? Um, I know you talk about the, the gut brain connection. I mean, anybody who's been nervous <laughs> knows that, you know, maybe you have to poop. Maybe you have, to, you know, like when you're really nervous or, um, you know, if you're really feeling guilty, I noticed, um, I had a, a period in life where I had done something I felt really guilty about. I couldn't eat. I, it, and for me, that's real weird, <laughs> real weird. So I was like, wow, you know, so could you talk about the um, impact of emotions on gut health? So the, this is the, this is a spoiler alert for my book. I mean, this is the big <laughs> secret that I reveal that the key to your gut health is your mental, emotional, and spiritual health. Love it. And it is because of the gut brain connection. So the gut, that tube has a nervous system that surrounds it. It's called the enteric nervous system, somewhere between hundred and 500 million neurons in that nervous system. The, that nervous system more than your brain has, and that nervous system is connected to your brain by your vagus nerve. So we have 12 cranial nerves and they run to different parts of our brain and body and the cranial nerve number 10, your vagus nerve runs from your brain to your gut and it carries signals in both directions. It also carries signals to your heart and lungs. So the vagus nerve is really the key to your gut health. The vagus nerve runs on the autonomic nervous system, the automatic nervous system, which can either, which can be in two responses, sympathetic and parasympathetic. Sympathetic is fight or flight, parasympathetic is rest and digest. Now that I live in Montana, the analogy I give is I'm out and both, both nervous systems are important. We need a balance between the two. So I'm out hiking in the mountains and there's a grizzly bear. My sympathetic nervous system hopefully is activated. The blood and energy go to my brain and muscles to survive. If I do survive and then I make it to my campsite, I'm having s'mores by the fire, I'm in rest and digest. The blood and energy are going to my gut to break down food. So both responses are, are crucial, but people nowadays are living as if they're running from a bear 24 seven. Right. We, the, we wake up and the first thing we do is check our phone and it's email and texts and phone calls and breaking news and social media. And so right away, the mind is telling the gut via the vagus nerve, like, Hey, we don't need you today. Right. You're, you're, you're off today. And then you sit down for breakfast and you're responding to emails or you got the news on and the gut's super confused because it's like, well, well, hold up. There's food here. Um, I need to break this down. But the, the mind is saying, no, 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 no. The energy, we don't have time or energy to do that right now. So right. when that happens, your stomach stops producing stomach acid. Stomach acid is how you digest protein, how you activate your other digestive enzymes, how you get vitamins and minerals out of your food. So you need stomach acid. Your small intestine becomes leaky. You can actually, you shut down your probiotics from growing when you're stressed out. So I always warn my patients, if you do a stool analysis, I can see how stressed out you are based on your microbiome. So there's that. certain bacteria that are suppressed mm -hmm. because this is, I mean, people come to me for all types of different things. I, I work with all conditions, but, and my patients will follow any diet, follow any supplements, um, do any testing that I recommend. But when I bring up the mental, emotional, spiritual part, it's like, screw you like that, that, that's not, uh, that's not a factor for me. And it is for most of us. And my general, my experience is that for most of us, it starts as trauma when we're children. And my favorite definition of trauma is trauma is anything less than nurturing. So most people think of trauma as like violence mm -hmm. and other I things. I love that. Like that. Yeah. Trauma is anything less than nurturing. So that could be as simple as I come home from school I'm trying to show off my homework and my parents are too busy to pay attention, right? Yeah. Well, now a signal is I'm not good enough. And that can lead to a sympathetic nervous response, which shuts down the gut. That can persist for, you know, it gets worse. You go to high school and college and, and 
um, jobs and, and marriage and, uh, you know, the, the stress just never, it just keeps building. The gut is shut down co consistently. And some people will present with disease when they're 10 years old. Some people will present when they're 40. Some people will present when they're 70. But for most people, it started when they were kids. Yeah. Um, so that, that is, you know, this other stuff that like low stomach acid, food sensitivities, SIBO, candida, parasites, that stuff is all pretty easy to me. Um, there's good mm -hmm. testing. There's proven treatments. It, it, it's, it's a smooth course when mental, emotional, spiritual health is balanced. When it's mm -hmm. not, I, I tell my patients there, there's not really much hope to get this under control if you don't get that mental, emotional, spiritual part under control. Thank you for being a voice for that. I know for me, when I'm um, getting new clients and they have gut issues, I always ask, when did it start? You know, and they might say 2013 and I'll be like, so what happened in 2013? Uh, like, I'm just like, how comfortable are you telling me your trauma right away? <laughs> you know, cause that's, it's, it's always, it's pretty much always the case. I've even, um, my audience is well aware that I'm an advocate of plant medicines. And one thing that I have noticed in those journeys is, um, sometimes when people are about to process a trauma, they will have to excuse themselves and go to the bathroom, which I think is super interesting, right? It's just like, as soon as it's coming up, the gut is like, Oh, you know, <laughs> there's this crazy release that happens. And so, yeah, um, I had a client recently speaking of the vagus nerve, um, she was having gut issues, you know, we're doing all the mechanical things, right? Like we're, you know, we do mindset coaching too. So that was part of the process, but we were doing the, the betaine HCL and the digestive enzymes and, you know, MCT oil and all these things. And she, um, she independently solved it herself. And she told me, she was like, Tara, I am pooping. I am pooping. And I'm like, awesome. I'm like, what's going on? She's <laughs> like, I did a vagus nerve breath work <laughs> workshop and I have, I'm completely, it's completely gone. I can totally poop now. And I'm like, oh my gosh, send me the workshop, <laughs> you know? So it's yeah. usually heart rate variability. Uh, there's training programs that that's what I send people to that. That is basically how you treat your vagus nerve is heart rate variability. So you can buy um, apps or for your computer or phone with a sensor that goes to your ear or finger. Mm -hmm. It will track your heart rate and will teach you how to calm down. It gives you meditations to do, breathing exercises to do mm -hmm. um, while you're watching your heart rate. So it, it helps train people how to calm down when they're getting agitated. Yeah. So you see, I mean, that makes sense, right? It's uh, a low HRV would be correlated with not being able to go back and forth between your parasympathetic and your sympathetic in a healthy way. Right. And yeah, it makes sense. I first, sometimes with all the gut health issues out there, I'm like, gosh, I'm so lucky. Like I, it hasn't been a part of my path. Like I have really good gut health and I'm grateful for that. And if my H, you know, I, I wore a whoop strap and an oar ring forever because I'm a biohacker and my HRV is really high, you know, really, really high. So it makes sense. Nice. So that, I like that, um, that, tidbit there, that piece of advice to check your HRV and make sure that that's healthy. And, and, um, you know, what are some other, uh, strategies, I guess you'd say for people who have, it's like, okay, yeah, I have got issues. And like, <laughs> I've noticed with stress, it's so funny because people don't, they're so used to stress sometimes that they don't think they're stressed out. Right. Or they're so used to suppressing emotions that they don't realize they're even doing that. Right. So what are some strategies for people who are like, okay, maybe fine. I'll check into this mental, emotional, spiritual thing. Yeah. I have a question on my, when a patient comes in to see me, they fill out like 40 pages of intake paperwork. There's a question on there that says, the first question says, do you have an excess amount of stress in your life? And the follow-up question is, can you manage that stress easily? Love that. And, it, and if somebody answers, no, I don't have excess stress and yes, I manage it easily. I know we're in trouble. It, oh, wow. nine, that, I mean, my own personal story is like, I'm in recovery. I had an alcohol problem. Uh, so I'm very familiar with denial. Right. And that to me, when I see those questions, I'm like, this person is probably in denial. I mean, you know, especially mm -hmm. post what we've been through in the last two years. Um, I, I, I think we all have excess stress and eliminating stress is not an option, right? It's, it's never going to go away if there'll be a next pandemic or job or whatever, there's always going to be something. So it's like, how do you deal with it? So I've recommended every patient I've ever worked with to get a therapist. Um, 
therapists helped me discover like why I drank, right? Because it yeah. didn't really, I didn't, there wasn't a great reason for it until we dug into it. <laughs> um, yeah. And so I, I, my patients that are doing the best are in therapy. Yeah. Um, and a piece of advice that I give that I kind of laugh about is to get off the internet. Um, so chapter one of my book is basically kind of making fun of what happened when I Googled abdominal pain um, and all the things I could convince myself of. And the internet is amazing because like my career, my job wouldn't exist without it. But I've mm -hmm. seen so many people so sick because they're reading, you know, over and over blogs and posts and, and right. like, can convince themselves they'll never get better. So mm. my advice is to find someone that you trust and trust that person and work with them and get off the internet. And it that's another thing. None of this stuff holds for everybody, but right. people that come to me, it's usually like they've done a lot of their own research. And sometimes it's, that's a great thing because that's how they find me, but it's also can go way too far as well. Mm -hmm. So a, a, a tip that I give is every time you want to get on the internet and Google what's wrong with you, try meditating instead and see what happens yeah. with your health. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. I, that's something I practice and encourage my clients to do during meditation is to just put your hand on your heart, close your eyes and say, Hey body, what do you need? And it'll tell you, it'll tell you, it'll be like, I need you to lay off the freaking caffeine, or I need you yeah. to stop running so that injury can heal, or I need you to eat some nutrients or, you know, it, yeah. it, it will. And I, that's, I, I love that piece of advice because um, I'm reading the biology of belief by Dr. Bruce Lipton right now. I'm not sure if you've read that, but, um, it's, it's so, um, fascinating how much our, our body responds to our mind and our thoughts. You know, um, I had another client recently that a, a massage therapist had suggested to her that possibly she had degenerative disc disease. And I was like, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Did, did, like, does he have any evidence for this? Because like that, that, that thought it was bugging her a lot. Like she was in like total stress over this, like, oh my gosh, she, I mean, she had accepted this belief with no evidence. And so I immediately sent her to somebody else and she found out she didn't have it. Right. Yeah. And it, it um, that's what I wanted to ask you about that too. Um, an experience now I can't say this is for sure what happened, but it, it, it was interesting to me. Um, I do ketogenic diet coaching. And mm -hmm. when I first was exploring the world, um, the world of keto, I also, you know, kind of came on you, you, keto is kind of like a gateway drug to like health optimization and biohacking mm -hmm. and all this kind of stuff. So I was getting into that. And I was reading that everyone has a gluten intolerance. It's the worst thing you can eat ever. And so I, took this as face, uh, you know, at face value. And I'm like, I, I can't, my body cannot tolerate gluten. I went off keto, you know, and then I had some gluten and I got diarrhea for like two or three days. Like it was like horrible. It felt like I had like food poisoning and I'm like, yup, see gluten is so bad for you. And then after maybe a year, you know, growing more in my <laughs> journey, I was like, you know what? I don't know. I don't know if I actually have like, if I do, it might be very small or I don't know. I actually, I just, I don't think I, I got in the energy of, I don't think I do have a gluten and, and sensitivity. And the next time I ate gluten, I was fine. Now I have noticed that if I eat a lot of gluten, I do wake, my muscles are more sore when I wake up in the morning. And that's kind of interesting. Right. Cause I'm like, I haven't felt my legs be sore. Ah, I had bread yesterday. Interesting. If it's like a lot, <laughs> a right. lot of bread. So uh, anyway, my question bringing that story up is, do you believe that there is a, a, a mind, a belief system component when people are eating certain foods that this is going to hurt me, that it can actually manifest that way in their gut? I know it's kind of a woo woo question, but I'm just curious your opinion on it. <laughs> no, it's a hundred percent. You're correct. Yeah. And that's kind of an, another crazy thing that I talk about is specific, actually, like, so too much information on the internet and for a lot of people too restrictive of diets. Mm. Right? And most people that when they're coming into me are like expecting like, okay, um, he's going to change my diet. I'm going to come mm -hmm. off a bunch of foods. Right. Most people that come to me have already tried five different diets and they're right. like eating like five or six things. And I'm like, this, this is a disaster. Like you need to eat right. more. So I think that's another area where we've swung too far. And, and yeah. one of them specifically is when we're treating candida overgrowth of the gut. For whatever reason, there's a lot of information online that has convinced people that you could never treat candida without mm. the perfect candida diet. Mm. And that is not true. 
um, you can. And I've told, and so I've seen specific to the Candida diet, like people so stressed mm -hmm. out about this mm -hmm. diet, right? Mm -hmm. And I tell them, I'm like, I would rather have you eating fast food every day than trying to focus on this Candida diet because it's making you nuts. Right. And I know what, what happens mean. when we're stressed out? Cortisol is released. What does right. cortisol do? Suppress your immune system and cause sugar to be released. What is Candida's favorite environment? A suppressed immune system and sugar. Such a good point. So it's, you know, that restrictive diets have their place for sure. Mm -hmm, and it, mm -hmm. usually the first thing in gut health is identifying food sensitivities. And so I go through the whole elimination diet in my book and we have recipes and, and how to do that. But in a lot of people, it, they have gone too far and it is, you know, it, we, we need to heal. Like there's trauma around eating, right? Yeah. Like people are literally terrified of foods. And I'm like, the, you know, so th th that's a type of trauma and you send them to food therapists and, yeah. and like, it's, it's a healing journey, just like trauma with anything else. So, yeah. um, just as someone that believes that mental, emotional, spiritual health is the most important part of health and gut health, I'm fine with restrictive diets. Um, if the, if you can tolerate them, like if they're yeah. not, you know, if they're making you happy, like my best friend is a raw vegan. He loves it. Right. Um, right. But that's not for me. Um, so, and the, another, uh, uh, with your story about like, what, am I sensitive to gluten or not? Yeah. The important thing to understand is that sensitivities can change. Mm. So just because you're sensitive to soy today, we, yeah. I encourage patients to try every six months because in six months you might not be, you might be sensitive to something new. I, I personally don't have any food sensitivities, but I do usually at least one elimination diet a year to just check in on that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so that it, they are something that can change over time and is likely to change over time. I love that message. I tell my clients that too, because sometimes I'll go to these gut specialists and they're like, oh, I can't eat this. And I'm like, that doesn't mean you can't eat that forever. It just means your body is saying, Hey, that's kind of hurting me right now. Right. You know, like, will you please let me heal the, the analogy I've always used is like, if I have, if I get road rash, like I'm on a motorcycle and I just tear up my arm and I pour apple cider vinegar on it, it's going to really irritate it. And it's going to prevent it from healing. But that doesn't mean once I let that heal, cause I stopped pouring the freaking apple cider vinegar on it. I can pour apple cider vinegar on my arm all day long when it's not yeah. torn open and inflamed. And, you know, and so it's like, I kind of look at food sensitivities that way too. It's like your body's just saying, Hey, right now, ouch, like that food yeah. freaking hurts. Cause I've got an owie, you know? So That's I love that yeah, I like message. That. Um, also on the, um, manic <laughs> when, when, when food, is becoming the biggest stressor in your life. Mm -hmm. Um, that that's, you know, so I, yes, I am supportive of a ketogenic diet and certain applications, you know, for certain things. Um, I have a book coming out on it this year about like why I think people should stop doing keto and it probably not be a long-term thing. So that's kind of my position in the, in the keto space, because I look at keto as a pendulum swing. Um, mm -hmm. and for some people who have really high blood sugar, a lot of inflammation or, you know, certain um, diseases that can be really helpful. But my goal is always to bring us back into balance where you can just eat like a normal human and thrive and be healthy and not have to have these like huge restrictions around food. Um, and I, so I appreciate your message of, um, <laughs> truly like that's part of my book too, is like the, the cortisol going up so much because of your stress around food, like what's going to be worse for you, you know, and it's, it's out of control. I think right now, like I get yeah. people that are like, Oh, I heard natural flavors is bad. Like I can't ever have anything with that. that like uh, there's a tremendous fear around yeah. food in the world right now. And I do think like you're saying, the internet is sort of responsible for that because a lot of people it's have how fear. you get clicks is, is create fear. Yep. Yep. It's like fear messages around food. So, um, thank you for sharing that. Cause, <laughs> cause to say like, I'd rather you have fast food than be obsessed with food. I, like I get where you're coming from. It's, um, yeah. and sometimes I get clients who, sorry, I'm talking so much. I'll, I'll <laughs> move to you next, but sometimes I get clients that eat a standard American diet and they have better blood work than my little health optimization geeks that are super obsessed, right? They have like perfect blood work. And I'm like, 
and they're like 200 pound woman, you know? And I'm like, there we go. Because maybe possibly because she hasn't been freaking stressed out of her mind about her body. I don't know, you know? So right. anyway, appreciate your messages about being stressed about, um, that, um, the Vegas my favorite. I wanted oh, to ahead. share my favorite story from keto. Um, okay. Yes, please. <laughs> I play basketball for like uh, exercise and pick up nice. basketball. And one day, one of the guys I play with found out what I did for a living. And he's like, you know, I, oh yeah, do you know about the keto diet? And I was like, yeah, you know, and he's like, yeah, I tried it, but I had to eat three Big Macs without the bun just to feel full. Oh God. <laughs> yeah. Like, don't get me started. <laughs> That was my favorite story. Uh, I know. <laughs> yeah. That's the kind of stuff that I live with on the daily. Um, <laughs> no offense if that's, you know, I'm not just trying to offend anybody, but that's definitely not an optimal way to be eating all the time. Yeah. Okay. I actually have a question. I don't know if you even have an opinion on this. I'm curious, um, your thoughts on, I mean, you, you mentioned elimination diets. So carnivore is really popular right now, right? That's right. becoming a very popular approach. And for me personally, long-term, I would never want someone to like, only be able to eat meat unless they're like your raw vegan person that they're like, that's all I want to eat. I love it. You know, like if that's just how you roll, then that's fine. You know, but, um, I've heard differing, um, experiences of people with carnivore. Like some people are like, yeah, like they, they got rid of their depression and anxiety. You know, they had like poor gut health and it was this elimination and things got to heal and they feel great. And then I've had people tell me like that complete, like I did not have normal digestion for like six months to a year after doing that. Like it completely destroyed me. So I'm just here. Do you have an opinion on carnivore? Yeah. I mean, I was kind of shocked when I heard about the carnivore diet. I had a patient <laughs> introduce me and I was like, whoa, um, I know that it's worked for plenty of people and people mm -hmm. like it. I, I don't really see how it's a good long-term diet at all. Yeah. I have a couple theory uh, theories on why people get better on a carnivore diet. The ones that say they get better SIBO. The, yeah. the most common gut condition I treat is called SIBO, small right. intestine bacteria overgrowth. That is when your microbiome has moved from your large intestine into your small intestine. And your gut bacteria in your small intestine is where you should have microvilli. That is where 90% of digestion and absorption happen. So small intestine, the 20 feet of the small intestine should be reserved for digestion and absorption. When you have SIBO, the gut microbiome, and it doesn't matter if it's probiotics or candida or dysbiotic bacteria, what, if it's overgrowing the small intestine, you will get horrific symptoms, which could be gut symptoms, but I mean, SIBO is so common. I put a whole chapter on it in my book and it's because another, there's just a lot of, I think, bad information out there. And I've worked with it for quite a while and had a lot of success treating people with it. But something I learned over the years is that I've met a, a lot of SIBO patients that don't have any gut symptoms at all. And they're mm. coming in with just eczema or just joint pain or arthritis wow. or autoimmune. 100% of people that I've ever worked with that have been diagnosed with fibromyalgia have SIBO. Wow. And so one of the ways that we treat SIBO is to starve the gut bacteria. That is called a low FODMAP diet. Yeah. I think that's why, I mean, if you're just eating mostly meat, I think that's one of the reasons you might feel better. Right. Um, I, I don't, I mean, and I could be wrong about it, but it, it kind of goes like my, dietary advice to people. I like to keep everything simple. If you can make just one change, it would be to eat nine to 12 servings of vegetables and fruit a day. And if you're eating that many vegetables and fruit, there's not room for all the other stuff. Mm -hmm. And that obviously it's going to depend on what's going on in your microbiome, et cetera. Right. right. Yeah. Um, one other theory about the people that get worse on when they start doing the carnivore thing, low stomach acid. Mm, yeah. Hydrochloric acid is how we digest protein. So people that are eating a bunch of protein and feeling bad, they have low stomach. The number one cause of low stomach acid is stress. So if you're stressed out about the carnivore diet and then <laughs> you're eating a bunch of meat, you're not allowing your body to break it down. Um, so that, that's, that would be my theory on the people that get worse, but I mean, yeah. it, it's, it seems to be a relatively new fad and um, yeah. we'll, we'll learn a lot about it, I guess, over the years, but um, yeah. 
I, I wouldn't really tell anybody to do it. Yeah. Thanks for sharing your opinion on that. It's, you know, in the keto world, it's very popular and there's a lot of people that are just super, super big on like, yes, you can't, it's, it kind of reminds me of when keto got really popular in like 2016, 2017, it was like, this is the optimal way for humans to eat only ever. And yes. I feel like carnivore is kind of in that energy yes. right now, you know, and yes. at the keto space, I feel like has kind of come over that hump for the most part. And people are starting to talk about cycling and carbs and, you know, maybe not doing keto forever. Um, uh, and I feel like carnivore is kind of in that it's, 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 it, I find it a bit dogmatic. I, I think it's a useful tool in certain cases, like you're talking about, like when there's a lot of gut issues, but I, I, I personally don't recommend being, I, I'm a big fan of vegetables and fiber as well. I mean, when we look at short chain fatty acids and the fermentation that happens and how that feeds our mental health, our mood, you know, and the, the carnivore people say, well, beta hydroxybutyrate, you know, with the key, that's ketone body. So you're getting some of that butyrate. So you don't need it from the fiber. And I'm like, okay, but that's fine to eat. You know, I, I can see their point there, but to me, it's, um, I it's when I look at vegetable, I'm a big fan of nature. So when I look outside, you know, I see plants and, and, and animals. And so I choose to eat both of them and it's been very beneficial for me. And I'd say probably most people in the history of time. So, um, anyway, thank you for sharing that. Um, uh, let's see last thing. Um, I think actually, I, I think I hit most of my big questions that I had for you. Was there anything else and unfunk your gut, which I love the name, by the way, mm -hmm. um, that you think might be beneficial pe for people to know in terms of gut health? Um, so what I think we've hit on the key points of gut health, um, the, what my book can help people with is like how to get started. If you don't have a functional medicine doc, nice. So the first steps are to do the elimination diet. What we found over the years is we'd see people getting worse when they start elimination diet. So obviously we're like, what, what is this? Why hmm. they have SIBO? Because yeah. usually when you start an elimination diet, you're eating more high FODMAP foods, you're feeding the problem. Mm. So patients that we suspect have SIBO, um, we put them, we call it the cause plan. It's an elimination diet that is also low FODMAP. Yeah. And so that is my, the instructions are in there on how to do that. The recipes are there. Nice. The second most important step is to assess your digestion and assess low stomach acid. So I give all the screening tools and the treatment for that. Nice. Um, and then it's um, just the microbiome, the further education on that. And then things that have worked for me for mental, emotional, and spiritual health, and just how to create awareness, things that you can try. Um, so I think our job as um, practitioners is most important job is education. And any patient that's come in to me, the initial visits always just straight education. And that that's what I put in my book. And I think another thing that I've heard the feedback on is people that have read it and gone to other functional medicine doctors are like, you honestly, you might know more about functional medicine from reading that book than, than some of the doctors that are practicing functional medicine, just because they're so new in it. Mm -hmm. um, so the, I explain SIBO testing, what to look for, how to do it, stool testing, organic acid testing. So you know, the right questions to ask your practitioner, like, okay, these are the tests that we need to be doing. Um, so I think that those are all helpful tools in there. Yeah. That sounds amazing. Um, you know, the, the spiritual thing I'm thinking about, like, it's so crazy how much people minimize that when it's like, think about how you feel when you're at work or you're at your house and you're behind a computer screen and you're just like stressed out versus like the last time you went on a hike in a mountain or the last time you were laying next to the beach, like think about how you felt yeah. like it matters. You know, these little things, like they completely change our state, our health, our life. So I love that you're putting that in there. And I also have to say, thank you for writing a book and getting on podcasts when you're doing the work every day. <laughs> Cause I guess yeah. it's just a little pet peeve of mine when, um, I, I I'm being a terrible person, but when it's like a lot 
lot of the messages coming on social media and stuff are coming from people who are not actively practicing those things with people. And so they're preaching a lot of theory. And it's like, when you're working with people day in and day out, the dogma goes away real quick because you get your ass handed to you and you get humbled and you're like, actually that didn't work. That doesn't work for everyone, you know? (laughs) So thank you for coming from the trenches, you know, being in there with people every day and sharing. (laughs) Thank you for recognizing that. Cause that's like, I've personally always stayed off of social media and the, all of that. And like, just focused on being a good functional medicine doctor. And eventually I kind of got the motivation to put that onto paper. Yeah. So that, that's what I think a lot of people have appreciated about my book too, is it's very real. Like it's very, (laughs) very practical. Like, Hey, this, you know, this is why things might not work, even though your favorite like celebrity is saying they, they work for them. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, being in the trenches, it's right. It's, yeah. And it's not, mo- I, I find there's, there's kind of almost like two types of people, the people who are willing to be in the trenches or the people who are willing to be on social media. You don't always find that paired, you know? So thank you for, cause it's being on social media and writing a book. It's, it's very vulnerable, you know, it's, it's takes, it's like a journey in and of itself. So thanks for being willing when you've been doing this for so long with people day in and day out and coming and sharing with us today. It's been awesome to dive into gut health guys. We'll put the uh, links to his website book, everything in the show notes. Again, the name of the book is unfunk. So it's at U N F U N C Yes, <laughs> your guts. Okay. <laughs> At my practice, we, we have a saying that we put the funk in functional medicine. Oh, I love so that. Okay. That's that where makes sense. <laughs> unfunk came from. <laughs> I love it. All right. Thank you so much. It's an honor. Thank you.